Hello and welcome to our next session for this week, and we're going to be looking at privacy. To start us off, I'd like to share a quick video with you so that we can have a backdrop as to how our lives are becoming more and more, I would say, open to the public in the context of a lack of privacy. All right, so that's just to give you a glimpse into how it is that the information that we put out there, whether willingly or unwillingly, um, you know, you've entrusted the healthcare providers. You would have seen that the breaches that occurred, most of them that occurred in 2022 were in the healthcare sector. And that's very worrisome in the sense that you've entrusted the healthcare sector with your information, but just as a result of the cyber attacks that have been occurring, your information is actually out there in the public domain. And if you've been following cases that um, relate to those social media platforms, I would say Facebook and Twitter, um, to, to be exact, you would have seen that Mark Zuckerberg, the founder and CEO of Facebook, has had to answer questions about the types of um, you know, privacy that citizens are allowed, users are allowed on that particular platform. And in effect, we've actually given you know, Facebook and all the other social media platforms permission to use our data once we put ourselves out there in the public domain. In fact, we cannot assume any more come of privacy once we've willfully placed some information out there as it relates to our lives. And of course, you know, from the meals that we're eating right down to our vacation time abroad, right? So privacy is something that we should really be taking very closely, um, you know, in terms of, of, of just, having a, a close attention to, but making sure that what we're doing is not necessarily willfully um, actually surrendering our privacy to the rest of the world. So we can actually do so in a way that is unconscious as a result of the nature of the technology that we're using. Technology has made it very difficult for us to remain private citizens or to live private lives. And of course, in some cases, we're the ones who are actually giving the permission for the information to go out there. If you're working with a company, you will find that they are taking steps to make sure that there are limited data, data breaches. I think the university is also doing so in terms of prompting us to do the changing of the password every 90 days, I believe. So you'd want to take heed where those types of security measures are concerned at the level of the university or your data. All right, so for today's session now, I'd like to share with you what you might deem as those persons who are, like we said, public and private figures in the last module and what it is that we can expect in terms of their levels of privacy and what all of us can expect or we want as citizens. Now, privacy really is that ability to be left alone and it's commonly thought to be a constitutional right, but it's just generally not so, all right? I would say following the attacks in the United States, the 9-11 attacks, we have ceased to be private. I recall being very enamored by that particular show. Um, I binged it, it's called Person of Interest. And so what it was created around is the fact that we're living in a very surveilled society. We're living in an organized type of network arrangement where every single thing is linked to um, you know, your social. It was linked before, but there's just this tightly knit tracing of information right now from your conversation on Google um, to every single thing that you're actually trying to buy or to purchase. So the algorithms are trained in such a way to pick up your patterns. And so there is this veil 
um, that has been removed in terms of um, privacy that you once enjoyed, that we once enjoyed as citizens of this planet. And so technology has made, uh, or I would say fast track with the removal of the privacy that we once thought that we had in society. So in effect, there is no such thing as a right to privacy, legally speaking, once you've given your information to someone out there in the public, all right? And so what people mistakenly think to be the right to privacy is derived from the search and seizure clause of the first of the Fourth Amendment, which reads that, and I quote, the right of the people to be, to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated, and no warrants shall issue, but upon probable cause supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. So this Fourth Amendment clause here that says, you know, you have a right to be secure in your person or houses. Yes, it is still there. But if you're in your home, in your private space, and you're actually out there browsing, you know, you're in your home, you're in your backyard, you're in your bedroom, and you're looking to shop online, then really, if you're giving out your credit card, your debit card information, your social, then that privacy is no longer, you know, under the wraps, so to speak. So protection against unreasonable searches and seizures is not the same as a right to privacy. Police have to have some sort of cause to actually come there to issue that warrant. There has to be court identified document, all right? The courts have to identify some sort of tort, as we say, or wrongdoing with respect to privacy. So rather than saying that people have the right to privacy, the courts have said that there are some times that you shouldn't do some things that you shouldn't do to people rather with respect to their privacy are infringing on their privacy. So in this session, I really want to focus on, you know, the poor privacy torts and we will examine where the case all started. So let's go to Robinson, Robertson rather versus Rochester Folding Box, the Franklin Mills. And I like to go back to those very early cases to just let you know how we've evolved as a society in the context of privacy breaches. So in the early 1900s, young Abigail Robertson, she was a teenager at the time, she went to a professional photographer to shoot her portrait. We didn't have selfies back then or selfie sticks, so she wanted a studio photo, all right? So months after the photo um, you know, shoot that she had, she saw her photograph on posters and boxes without her consent. In fact, 25,000 copies of her picture were distributed in New York to promote the actual agency. All right, Franklin Mills. Now, what she actually did, you know, she said, this is really very shocking. It was humiliating. Perhaps there was some issue there with self-esteem. We don't know. But she said she could not leave her bed for a while because her family, you know, her family were like, you know, what's happening with you? So they filed an injunction and sued for 15,000 in damages. Remember, we spoke about damages. And this is not, you know, just presumed, but Clearly, she was getting therapy. Um, she was not probably eating. So all of these things were really in the context of the psychological effects of seeing her photograph. And of course, there was a lot of buzz and sympathy for what she was going through at the time. All right. She had fallen victim to what is known as a gross violation of her privacy. So given the public sentiment, the jury found her, um, you know, to be um, having, you know, all of these effects, they ruled in her favor and they awarded damages um, against Franklin Mills. And so in the appeals court, they said that the so-called right to privacy has not as yet found an abiding place in our jurisprudence and they reversed the verdict. So the matter went all the way to the appeals court, all right? Of course, the public were shocked and they were dismayed that you would do something like that um, in the context of somebody's privacy. So this is how this particular case transpired in the context of what exists as privacy courts. Now, protection against unreasonable searches and seizures is not the same as a right to privacy. That's what I did emphasize earlier. So for the courts, they consider some torts or wrongdoings with respect to privacy in lieu of people having the right to privacy. And they said that there are some things that you should not do to people. Number one, intrusion. Privacy tort number one, if you decide to just descend upon somebody's seclusion or solitude, you can actually be in breach of that person's privacy on the grounds of intrusion. 
All right. In most states, to make out an intrusion or seclusion claim, you must generally establish four elements. Now, you've got to establish that the person was there intentionally, they invaded your space and you did not invite them. Second, the invasion must be offensive to a reasonable person. You're in your bed and I'm getting up and finding you standing over me. That is really, really very offensive. It's scary and it's offensive. Thirdly, the matter that the defendant intruded upon must involve a private matter. All right. If we follow the case of, I would say, um, the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi's husband's intrusion, it was a private matter. This individual in his head went there in his private capacity to harm, that's what he said in his own words, to harm the speaker, the, the speaker of the house, to tell him certain things. And if she did not, he was going to, you know, scare her. Those were his words. All right. So the defendant it must involve a private matter. This is not something that is in the public domain. You and I, perhaps we have some sort of issue, whether it's in your head or whether it's something that happened between us, it is a private matter. And then finally, the intrusion must have caused mental anguish or suffering to the plaintiff. And we know, again, if we look at the case of the Pelosi's, it's going to take a while for him to actually recover. Um, he's been hit in his head, you know, with, with, a, with a blunt object. And so it's going to take a while. Fortunately, he pulled through. And so this intrusion here caused, and I'm sure it's going to cause them mental anguish for some time, thinking through the what ifs. And if it's happened to any one of your relatives or family members where you suffered, um, you know, mental anguish or whatever the particular physical results were, this is actually part of how you can actually sue for a breach of privacy because you've suffered through that particular storm. All right. Now, apart from intrusion, number two, it's public disclosure of embarrassing private facts. So public disclosure of embarrassing private facts, such as revealing someone's notorious past when it has no bearing on the person's present status, you can actually say that, you know what, I served my time. Yes, I did have a proclivity um, to, to, to public exposure, whatever it is, but I am now a changed individual. But suddenly I'm here as a CEO of the company and somebody's actually disclosing 20 years ago, that has been something that is actually covered. All right. Um, the plaintiff has to establish four elements to hold someone liable for this type of publication of private facts. Let's look at them. First, the disclosure of facts must be in the public. So you've shared it. It's gone viral. It's on YouTube. All right. Um, the private fact um, must be private and not generally known to everyone. So if you did not share it, nobody would have known that the person was actually, you know, bald. And what they're actually wearing right now is a toupee. So that can be something that is deemed to be very, very embarrassing. Or like I said, they did something that was illegal years ago when they were a teenager. And then suddenly you're bringing that to the public domain within the officer, telling everyone else in the public. It must be offensive to a reasonable person. Whatever the person, um, is, is, whatever lens they're using to look at it, they must see it as very, very offensive. All right. Like, how can you do this when this person has really gone past this particular stage in their life? Um, it should not be newsworthy. Like I said, an example of, oh, did you know he was bald all the time? And did you know that all these years this person is actually wearing a toupee? That's not their hair. Like, how is this even news when it comes to a legitimate public concern about the person, um, you know, lack of hair or something like that? Okay. So that can be an issue there. So any publicity that places a person in a false light that draws unwanted attention to aspects of the person's life Really, this public disclosure, um, it requires a whole lot to be proven. You've got to publish information widely and, of course, identify the plaintiff and, of course, place them in a false light in this particular situation. All right. Um, you, you have to, you know, really prove that the person was at fault who was publishing the information as well. And they had the capacity to understand that when they're doing the publication, it's going to be deemed as offensive. In other words, for them, it's a prank, but for you, it's not a prank. It's embarrassing, all right? Knowing that on the coke bad consumption is actually considered a taboo, this is an example, but publishing the information anyway, saying that they eat bats. Like, no, you don't do that because you have not established that those persons actually eat bats, all right? So you're playing into the hype, and of course, it's stereotyping as well in the context of that particular publication. You've used the person identity, 
and of course you're gaining, you know, um, in terms of what it is you're doing, their immediate and direct benefit is actually um, being affected. And so you're, you're even, you know, impersonating. So somebody's identity, like let's say a chef, Chef Ramsey, um, you know, you know, they, they, they use their identity for their immediate benefit um, as a chef. And they're saying that, you know, you're actually going to be X or Y place or you believe in a particular perspective. And this is actually public disclosure that is not necessarily taken lightly. Um, the defendant also utilized protected aspect of your identity, which constitutes a person's identity um, in terms of the variation by state. I did say here that monetary gains, you know, when you do this type of thing, you can be brought to the court. Um, some states like Florida also consider non-monetary non non gains impersonation for professional gains. Um, I use the example of if you were to use someone who is a public figure and you're saying that they believe in X or Y, you're putting them out there as if they have endorsed a particular idea. That is also something that can be brought to court's attention. Now, the Georgia laws protect name and likeness. Example, photograph or sculpture. But a state like California also protects the voice and signature in addition to name and likeness. I believe because we're in a deep fake type of era, a lot of states will actually move in this direction of protecting us, protecting people, not just the name and the likeness, but the voice and signature as well, um, as a result of what is happening in technology and those types of breaches that have occurred in the past. All right. So if the defendant utilize some protected aspects of the identity, then they can actually be brought to the court um, in the context of the public disclosure. Now, in the eyes of the law, public figures have the very lowest expectation of privacy, followed by all-purpose figures. So a president cannot expect privacy at any time because they're always going to be following him to see where he's eating, how many persons he's eating with, how many trips he's actually taking. And then, of course, those types of, you know, um, you know, all-purpose figures like actors and actresses, there's always going to be a throng of photographers. The paparazzi will be there. Everybody's going to be there. TMZ because they want to know what you're doing in your private time as well. All right? So public figures followed by all-purpose figures, they cannot necessarily expect any reasonable amount of privacy. And so that's the reason why some of them have moved into seclusion. They've moved into spaces that are not necessarily populated with a whole lot of people who are in media, who are in social media, who make it their business to follow, um, you know, and to be a part of the of, of the hype or to be a part of, of um, fan base, so to speak, all right? So this is um, an expectation that they cannot have in terms of privacy. Now, limited purpose public figures have some expectation, but private individuals, we have the highest expectation of privacy because there is nothing happening in our lives that will cause the, the, the cameras to be flashing all the time. All right, the photography, the attention. So everything else being equal, a private plaintiff has a significantly higher chance of winning a privacy suit, a lawsuit against a public figure, um, you know, against someone who is, 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 is actually in the context of a public domain. All right. So if we were comparing who can win and who's likely to win, the argument here is that a private person is likely to win um, over and above someone who's actually in the public domain because there's just a lot that they have to through um, in the context of, you know, um, misuse, misappropriation, and all of these other clauses. This brings me now to misappropriation. This is sometimes called appropriation. And if you're appropriating a person's name or likeness for personal advantage without consent, again, we go back to that particular Mills case. All right, Abigail Mills. Any advertisement that uses a celebrity's picture, footage, or drawing without their consent, in the case of Abigail, she was not a celebrity but any celebrity, they can actually sue for misappropriation. Um, you know, Jennifer Lopez, Brad Pitt, Angelina Jolie, um, you know, Serena Williams, Venus Williams, anybody who's out there as a public figure and you're using their likeness to promote your own goals or objectives. Um, we're not talking here about endorsements like LeBron James or whoever it is who's actually signed a contract with a, you know, sneaker company. We're talking about a private person, someone who, is actually taking the liberty of using an individual who's out there in the public for their own gains by associating them with the company or with the principles or policies of the company without the express permission of that particular individual. All right. So these, these are these are examples of misappropriation. 
Now let's get to privacy and ethics. And we're coming very soon to our case studies, I believe after this module. I hope that by now you've all got your case study book, your textbook, and you've started to look into some of those case studies. Now, print and broadcast media, they struggle with really balancing between the public's right to know and they want to know an individual's right to privacy. We know that all purpose figures will make the news. Something happens to the president, something happens to an actor. Everybody wants to know what is happening. And so sometimes for the persons who are in the business of news making, you know, Noam Chomsky calls it manufacturing consent. And we know that when newsmakers get into the business of producing, they're constructing social reality for all of us, right? I was once there, I was a journalist for years. And so in the construction of social reality, it's usually a toss up between, should the public know what is happening in terms of their taxpayers' dollars? Should they know what is happening in the context of gossip, in the context of morality? Um, do they need to know, all right? And so for public figures, it's assumed that the right to privacy is actually diminished because every aspect of their lives, whether it's what they do in their homes, in their bedroom, versus what they do with their spending, um, you know, all of that will get to the knowledge of the public. So news wasn't always so eager to cover the private lives of public figures. But when we get down to the 19, when we got to the 1960s, there was little to no mention of the press, of the personal indiscretions of John F. Kennedy. Up until then, and then after he died, everything came out. All right. So the private and the public lives will be reported upon when it comes to what is happening in the context of news. So that's where privacy and ethics are colliding. And that's where journalists have to decide whether it's newsworthy enough to talk about someone in terms of their moral or moral acts, so to speak. Now, all of this changed by the time we got to the 90s. Um, Bill Clinton's relationship with Monica Lewinsky was made very public and it was covered for a very, very long period. And of course, we heard about President Trump's affairs as well and his relationship with the First Lady and stuff like that, and Stormy Daniels and all of these different issues around, you know, what he did before and when he got into office. They're all now in the public domain because this has to do with, on our purpose, a very public figure. All right. Now, a critique and retort in terms of all that has happened in the past in terms of those very public figures is this whole notion of mediated voyeurism and, of course, the important issues for the public to know about the private lives of public figures, especially in those positions of power. The argument here is that, well, you know, we've got to know what's happening in their private lives. But for some people who are criti critiquing these particular approaches, for them, it's like, we don't need, necessarily need to know, leave the person alone, allow them to breathe, all right? And so that this is the reason why you will find that when there is an election cycle and somebody is actually nominated to go forward, there is this whole notion of let's see what happened in their past. So the media will dig up previous scandals. They will dig up how they were in their high school, how they were in their university. Um, the public figures, if you recall what happened with the Brett Kavanaugh hearing, um, quite a few persons came forward to talk about how they interacted with him. Women uh, made allegations. And then when it was Kitanji Brown Jackson's turn, um, the, the, the judicial um, committee, you know, Senate committee, they raised a whole lot of issues in terms of, so what are your beliefs? Sir? How do you define a woman? So you will find that when it comes to, you know, people's lives, uh, those who are holding public office, everything is going to come out there in the public domain. Some of it is not going to be very pleasant, but they cannot necessarily expect any privacy. But ethics have got to be integrated there in the context of what the media believes that the public should know about the private lives of those particular public figures. They cannot concoct because this is where defamation comes in now. If it is that they take it upon their own to make up stories, then it becomes a case for the courts to actually decide upon in the context of the publication, whether it's libelous or whether it's slanderous. Now, again, touching on privacy and ethics, Humanity standards of privacy are, you know, they're evolving every single day, but it's important for those in the news business to really examine their standards in relation to media coverage of private information. Every media house will have a code of ethics. We know that the Society for Professional Journalists, that particular code speaks to minimizing harm and speaking the truth. You will find that as we go deeper into this particular semester, truthfulness is the hallmark of the activity of not just the journalists, but the advertiser and those persons who are engaged in radio and television and all the different forms of media, all right? So there is this need to always strive for and put out 
that which is truthful in relation to the coverage of private information. Now, let's begin by discussing those particular distinctions between privacy and secrecy. Now, blocking information intentionally to prevent others from learning or possessing or using it or revealing it, really, <laughs> this is like, you know, you've got something to hide, right? It may be seen as privacy, but it's really secrecy. Privacy doesn't require that information ever reach the public view, but who has control of the information that and, and how it becomes public, this is a real concern here. So health information, and when I opened the class, you would have seen the data breaches and health information was leading in terms of the number of breaches that occurred in 2022. Health information, records related to finances, sexual orientation, and interpersonal communication are examples of private information, but they're not secrets, all right? Um, you sign, I sign, when you go there to do whatever it is, you, you sign to say whether you want your health information to be released. When we do the COVID tests, um, you know, once I remember getting a note when I tested positive last year spring, um, a note came, the healthcare provider would have shared the information, um, you know, the person who did the test with, 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 with the county. And so Gwinnett County would have written about steps to take to actually keep yourself safe and stuff like that. So your records are out there, right? Because you would have actually said that you consent. So sometimes we consent to making our records public. Sometimes there are data breaches. Now, records related to finances, it's private between yourself and the bank. But of course, somebody can actually state that. I'd like to see the person's financial record. Um, if your uh, particular credit score is being pulled up, there goes your financial record in terms of your ability to pay and your ability to honor your financial commitments and obligations, all right? So all of these are not necessarily secret, but they're private bits and pieces of information. Now, when it comes to publishing private information, journalists and PR practitioners and other media professionals are encouraged to use discretion, and discretion requires what we call moral reasoning. They should usually ask themselves whether people have a right to know the information. Is the information public record? Yes, you have a right to know how your taxpayers' dollars are being spent. So that this is really a question of a right, and it's a moral reasoning, all right? Again, do you legally have access to the information or whether people need to know the information? Does the public need to know about the information um, that is private because it affects them? So how does a person's private life affect the public? Um, are they spending out your money um, by taking expensive occasions? If that's the case, then they have a need to know the information. If they're not spending out the public's money, then there is no need to know. Now, is a greater harm being prevented when the awareness is actually raised or whether people just want to know the information? We live in a society that thrives in gossip. We've got to admit that. And of course, the interest in private information is in most cases due out of curiosity, all right? And then the final question is, you know, what's the, what's, what's the public doing with the information? Are they ridiculing or are they calling for greater access to information and accountability of those particular public figures, all right? Could they use the information, possibly use the information for personal gains and to the detriment of those persons who are being um, actually <laughs> breached in terms of their private lives. So all of these are considerations that the media will have to take into account when it comes to privacy and the ethical dimensions. Now, when you get into the text, you will see philosopher John Rawls' theory of distributive justice, and that theory suggests that news personnel use a veil of ignorance when making decisions about what type of information to publish about an individual. Assume that nobody knows that information, but when you're using it, you've got to be as objective as possible and understand those particular dimensions in terms of the public's need to know, their right to know, and of course, the want to know. So those questions have got to be very clearly answered and art articulated in the minds of those who are responsible for publishing the information so that there is no harm done to the individual. Now, here's the YouTube video on that veil of ignorance. I'd like you to access and to also um, have a look at that. And of course, reading ahead in your Media Ethics Issues and Cases text, chapter five, um, you know, read about privacy and looking for solitude in the global village. There is no solitude in some cases. And if you click on these cases, you will find that they're available um, they will lead you directly back to the case briefs in the case of Kaysen versus Baskey, uh, Steinbuck versus Cutler, Time Inc. versus Hill, and the list goes on, all right? 
So these are for your next session. Um, these are really for you having a deeper understanding of what is happening in the context of privacy. And again, I say to you, I urge you to make sure that you're protecting your privacy in the context of what you actually put out there in the public domain about yourself. You may be surprised that when you apply for a job, they're just pulling you in for that interview to determine the fit within the organization. They've got all that they need to know about you in advance based on what you have disclosed, or what I would see as self-disclosure in the context of your post. They're looking to see exactly who you're associating with and the like. So again, be very mindful of the fact that privacy really, it's something that all of us can, you know, be mindful of and consider in the context of self-disclosure, what we're putting out there. And um, just to be reminded that if you are a private figure and you want to remain that way, you'll be very, very careful about your particular disclosures that you're making. All right. So I'm going to stop my share for now and I'll end today's session on privacy.